very, very pleased to introduce our speaker for tonight. Stacy Renee Morrison often forgets what century it is. As fate would have it, she met her 19th century best friend in the form of a trunk abandoned on a New York City street. These two women who were born 133 years apart began a collaboration called The Girl of My Dreams. Morrison received a grant from the Rhode Island Council of the Humanities to research and make photographs about the trunk's owner, Sylvia DeWolf Ostrander. She has exhibited her photographs in New York, Rhode Island, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Toronto, Parma, Italy, Cordoba, Argentina, and Jeonju, South Korea. Her photographs have been published in Harper's Magazine, Dear Dave, Photography Quarterly, and the Providence Journal. In January of 2020, Stacy exhibited the contents of Sylvia's trunk for the first time, along with her work interpreting Sylvia's life at the Merchant's House Museum in New York City, which if you haven't been there, you definitely should. Morrison is currently working on an illustrated narrative nonfiction book based upon The Girl of My Dreams. She also just launched a silkscreen clothing line with images of Victorian women and ephemera named for her beloved Sylvia. Morrison teaches in the MFA Visual Narrative Department and BFA Photography and Video Department at the School of Visual Arts. She is a still life photographer who makes quiet, polite, and sometimes macabre photographs. She never misses an opportunity to dress up as a 19th century woman. So please join me in welcoming Stacy. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel, um, for hosting this lecture. I'm very grateful to the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation for having me. I am honored to be here. I also want to say a special thanks to the Merchant's House Museum, um, especially to Pi and Emily for um, all of your help with the exhibition that's at the house now. Um, and I'm also so grateful for everyone who is here tonight listening. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the the this, the lecture that I'm going to do today is based on the title of the exhibition now at the Merchant's House. It's called Sylvia, a 19th century life revealed. This presentation is a combination of my artwork, archival materials, and snapshots which are going to which serve as a visual biography of Sylvia DeWolf Ostrander. What I'm going to share with you tonight is a love story. It is a story of the strong bond between two women born 133 years apart. It is a story of the past and also a story of the present. It is a story about obsession. It's a story about women's history in the United States. It's a story about a 21st century woman, woman who haunts the life of a 19th century woman by doing everything in her power to research, consider, and reveal the life of this woman who died long ago. And it is also the story of a 19th century woman who has brought meaning, purpose, inspiration, and creativity into the life of a living woman, or me, um, and for this, so this talk is also about an artist and her muse. In 2002, I opened this small trunk that was discarded on Cosby Street in Lower Manhattan that my roommate had found. If I were to think about what this moment looked like in the cinematic context, the movie version of this event is it's soft, uh, soft focused lighting, very warm light, um, and a glow, a directed glow would come from the trunk. The cinematographer would focus on my hands as I gingerly removed each object and shift to my facial expression, which would change from amazement to wonder to tears. Not sad tears, but the tears that come when you are completely moved and awe-inspired by something. The music, maybe Mozart's Requiem, something very dramatic. And my notes for the costume designer, because I remember exactly what I was wearing that day, would be a vintage 1960s red and purple paisley shirt black pleated skirt that fell just below my knees and very uncomfortable shoes that gave me blisters throughout the day and I never wore again. I remember this moment so profoundly because it was the moment that I fell in love. As a photographer, I began to photograph all of the objects in the trunk. I used a large format camera and lit them in the studio. This was a woman that was almost abandoned to garbage, abandoned for garbage and almost lost to history. I wanted to highlight the beauty of these extraordinary objects, and I was creating this fictional world where she lived. I knew there were calling cards in the trunk that could solve this mystery of who this woman was, but in the beginning, I wanted to keep her relegated to my imagination. 
in the beginning, it was just the beauty of the objects that moved me and sustained me. And sometimes I wonder throughout the course of this project if I should have stopped here. So these are some of the contents, contents of the trunk that was left behind. This is a daguerreotype, a party invitation for a ball honoring the Prince of Wales dated October 18th, 1860. There was a box of wallpaper samples and on the back of the samples it said the room that it was from because this is where Annie saw the paper last. So who was this mysterious Annie? And these notes, these sentimental notes were so moving to me. This is a piece of wallpaper, a different sample from the box. A little book. It says, once there was a little doll, she was a good little doll and always told the truth. Perfume models wrote with a little bit of scent still trapped in them. And when I thought about the cotton and the corks and how this was someone's job was to make those corks and how they were all hand carved. A ribbon, a simply beautiful ribbon. More drawings, a seal just for letters, a tortoise hair clip. Sadly, that was broken. An illustration cut out from Godey's Ladies Book that's hand embroidered. Morning jewelry made out of human hair. Paper dolls. A few years later, something changed. And one day I had to know who this woman was. One afternoon I pulled out the trunk as I so often did. And I looked at her possessions with this new sense of urgency. I took the two calling cards in the box with the names Susan Amelia DeWolf and Susan Russell Bullock and did a search. And I soon discovered that they were the same person. One was her maiden name and one was her married name. Susan was born in 1820 and died in 1866. She had three daughters and one son who died before he was a year old. The daughters were Sylvia Russell Bullock, born July 16, 1841, Annie Amelia Bullock, born in 1843, and Elizabeth Mitchelson Bullock, or Dot as she was called, born in 1858. They were from Bristol, Rhode Island. I began to study the objects again in a whole new way. I slipped into detective mode. Certain objects were from after Susan's death, like the Daughters of the American Revolution pin. So I didn't think it was her trunk. It couldn't have been Annie's trunk because someone collected those wallpaper samples after her death. Her youngest sister, Dot, was only two years old at the time of the ball honoring the Prince of Wales, so I didn't think that she could be in attendance. And then I noticed on one of the calling cards that said Susan Russell Bullock, written in the slightest pencil script, was the name Sylvia Russell Bullock. And I knew that this trunk belonged to her. I repeated Sylvia Russell Bullock, Sylvia Russell Bullock, Sylvia Russell Bullock over and over again. And this cemented what would become an almost two decade obsession. I needed to know everything I possibly could about this woman. And this daguerreotype I actually realized is of Sylvia. She is the older girl and the younger girl is her, sis is her younger sister, Annie, who was born two years after. I began to do more research. I searched Bristol, Rhode Island and the names again, and I was not at all prepared for what I was soon to discover about Sylvia's history. A part of this story contains the horrific and inhumane history of slavery in the United States. For mere moments after I discovered the trunk belonging to Sylvia, the next thing I would discover was her great uncle James DeWolf. James DeWolf made his fortune in the slave trade. Along with his brothers, including Sylvia's maternal great-grandfather, John, they engaged in the triangle trade. The DeWolfs made rum in their distilleries in Bristol, Rhode Island, and then sailed to West Africa, where they traded the rum for men, women, and children, and brought the captives to family-owned plantations in Cuba. The enslaved were taken to Charleston, South Carolina, or auctioned in Havana, and the DeWolf ships in Cuba would be filled with sugar to bring back to Rhode Island in order to make the rum. I cannot presume to comprehend the pain felt and lasting trauma experienced by those impacted by slavery throughout history and its continuing legacy today. It is my hope that opening a dialogue about these issues deeply rooted in the history of our country will bring meaningful conversation to help address how the world needs to become more just, fair, and equitable.
to speak of these unspeakable horrors that permeate the past, I hope will contribute to a better present and future of racial, ju racial justice. Sylvia was born after her great grandfather and great uncle died. I do not know what or even if Sylvia knew about her ancestors' involvement in the slave trade. I do know she grew up privileged in a very unjust world, and this world is still unjust. If Sylvia did know about her family's past, I wonder how she reconciled this information. I look to her contemporary descendants for answers. In 2008, Katrina Brown, a descendant of James DeWolf, produced and directed a PBS documentary film entitled Traces of the Trade, a Story from the Deep North. The film follows 10 DeWolf descendants as they retrace the triangle trade and their family's past. Then in 2009, the Tracing Center was founded to create greater awareness of the full extent of the nation's complicity in slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and to inspire, acknowledge, to inspire acknowledgement, dialogue, and active response to this history and its many legacies for the purpose of racial justice. It made me very angry when I began researching, hour after hour in different archives, reading the histories of these men and her family, these men who did despicable things. This is what the historic record had rewarded. And I thought of all of the other voices that had been lost, the voices of women, the voices of people of color. There's so much information about Sylvia's male descendants throughout the years, but very little information, if any at all, about the women in her family. These women were all absent from that historical record, and I found this heartbreaking. Sylvia was merely a name written in a musty old ledger denoting her birth, marriage, and date, and death. I couldn't bear the thought of her life deduced to only three dates, a life, a life lived full of memories, experiences, and moments now erased. I wanted to change this. I wanted to give this woman her narrative back. With metaphoric galvanism, I wanted to bring her back to life. I had no idea how I was going to do that though, so my first step was to go to Bristol, Rhode Island. Bristol, Rhode Island remains very unchanged in lots of ways from when Sylvia lived in Bristol. The town was established in 1675 and considered part of Massachusetts until the mid-1700s. The British attacked Bristol during the Revolutionary War. Bristol holds the oldest 4th of July parade in the country. The historical part of town remains mostly the same since Sylvia lived there. In fact, both the house she grew up in as a child and the house that she lived in at the time of her death in 1925 are still there. I started photographing the places that she went or saw in her town. And I always had this vision of her kind of going, the town is the Narragansett Bay, it's right on the bay. And I always had this vision of her going to the water, going to the water, seeking solace of the water. This is the church that she belonged to, um, one of the stained glass windows. So I started photographing around her town, the things that she would have seen. And again, I'm thinking about making photographs in a way where I have to use the present to uh, find the past. Sylvia's father, Judge Jonathan Russell Bullock, he was a justice of the Supreme Court in Rhode Island. He served in the Rhode Island House of Representatives from 1844 to 1846. In 1860, he was elected the Lieutenant Governor of Rhode Island, and in 1865, he was appointed by Abraham Lincoln as a judge for the U.S. District Court of Rhode Island. So this is one of the earliest things that I discovered about Sylvia's father. So I'll read this in case people are looking on a small screen. Judge Bullock was not overly popular. His daughter Sylvia, sister of Dot, declined to speak to him. When kindly Mrs. Sam Drury offered to heal the breach by asking them both to tea, Sylvia told her, I won't set foot under the same roof with that, with that man. Why then, Mrs. Drury chirp, we can have tea in the garden. This was so exciting to find this footnote reference, you know, with, with that actually talked about Sylvia, and this book was an early read. It's sort of a gossipy history of the town of Bristol. And I thought this was a really fascinating snippet. The next fascinating snippet would be the will, Jonathan Russell Bullock's will, um, because the, it's a very short will, it's two pages, and the first page was, an, was a vindictive diatribe against Sylvia. Um, saying that he, she owed that her husband never repaid a loan and this is why he wasn't leaving her anything. And it was sort of filled with contempt, um, foreshadowing. I would later come to learn from correspondence about Sylvia's very re rocky relationship with her father. And there's one letter that is now, been, again, foreshadowing to what I would later discover. Um, there's one letter that exists that Sylvia wrote, which is a rebuttal to her father. And it made me so sad um, because this letter is so smart. 
And she just went, I mean, you could see the legal mind that she would have had. And if she was born at a different time period, I think she would have made a fa an amazing lawyer because she told him. So because Sylvia had a rocky relationship with Jonathan Russell Bullock, I have a rocky relationship with Jonathan Russell Bullock. And this was actually the house that Sylvia grew up in as a child. And it's on State Street in Bristol, Rhode Island. It's actually run as an inn. It's called the Wissing House. So for those that feel inclined, you can stay in Sylvia's house, which is so exciting for me um, to sleep in the house that she uh, grew up in as a child. So when I was making photographs, if you notice on the left side of the frame, there is a bit of a flare. And that's because I think Jonathan Russell Bullock didn't want me to have a good photo of the house. And he kept kind of interrupting it and putting himself in different flare positions. Now, the shade that I use for my camera, there's no way I could possibly get a flare. So I finally had to tell him, I said, you made the photograph better. I like it. And then the next time I photographed, there was no flare, but I always choose one of the ones with a flare to sort of describe the house. So Jonathan Russell Bullock, um, this house was, so this house on State Street, um, next, right next door, the State Street Methodist Church was built. And when the steeple went up, Jonathan Russell Bullock, apparently this was what the historian at the Bristol Historic Society told me this story, that he ended up selling the house because he was so worried about a storm coming and the steeple falling into his house. And I could substantiate that from looking at the records that he did indeed sell the house soon after the steeple was completed. Um, 39 years after his death in the great hurricane of 1938, his prophecy would come true and the steeple would crack off in the storm, but instead of falling on his house, it actually landed right on the church. So speaking of storms, Again, saying that I now have a rocky relationship with Jonathan Russell Bullock. The first night I stayed in the house, there was a terrible storm. Um, one of those, oh, which, I, I mean, lightning, wind rattling the windows. And I had a terrible nightmare where I actually woke up. I had this, where a man in an ascot, which I later recognized from the photographs when I saw photographs of him, was kind of around, his hands were around my neck. And when I woke up, my hair was wrapped around my neck. And up to this day, I now sleep with my hair up from that experience. And the next morning when I went to the cemetery to see the DeWolf family graves, there was a huge branch that had fallen off and I, kind of, again, because this sort of, this process is about obsession and love and sort of started screaming at this tombstone, um, like, you can't hurt Sylvia now. And um, so I'm gonna protect her. So I do find that I start talking, I talk to graves, I talk to clouds. Um, it's all part of the, the artistic process with this. So this is Sylvia's mother, um, Susan Amelia DeWolf. And again, I don't have much at this point to say about her because I didn't, there's not much information left in terms of what was kept in the historical record um, other than her sort of birth and death. Um, I will later come to learn um, more things about her. This was her grandfather, um, John DeWolf. And he sort of, again, from the, what the historian at the Bristol Histor Historical Society told me was is that he sort of was very um, against the family business. And he ended up becoming a scholar and he studied English, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and ethics, mathematics, chemistry, and astronomy. And he was a professor of chemistry at Brown University from 1817 to 1837. He was also a poet. And this was Sylvia's other great-grandfather, Alexander Roots Griswold, um, born in 1766 and died in 1843. And he was the fifth presiding bishop of the Episcopalian Church in the United States. And another historian in town told me, which she then showed me the photograph, um, that he was such a beloved bishop that many people in Bristol today still have his photograph up on the wall in their homes. So how do you translate the, how do you photograph the past and the present? Um, I tried to photograph what Sylvia saw. This was the clouds above her home. You know, what do I make photographs about? How do I see her world when I live in my world? And this is the, the great exciting challenge with this project. This, in 1861, when I was reading this book, um, titled 1861, about the history of uh, that year, I read that there was this comet 
Um, that was something that's a comet that we'll never see in our lifetime. And so it was on like a 800 year cycle. And it was what happened right before the Battle of Bull Run. And it was considered a harbinger of things to come. It sort of was considered a bad omen. So um, this is Sylvia looking at the comet um, on the Narragansett Bay in 1861. This is at her bedroom window, or what I think was her bedroom in the house. And that to me is so amazing to, to be in both the homes where Sylvia lived. I photographed period dolls in the backyard. There's two young, uh, there's two young granddaughters of the owner of the house now. Um, and I like to kind of think about their relationship in terms of Sylvia and her sister, Annie. And I had, I showed one of the daughters um, a picture of Sylvia and I said, can you draw her in chalk on the sidewalk? And she did, and she said, and I, and I she said, I, I made her dress shorter, though, because I wanted her to be able to run, which I thought was run away, which I thought was quite beautiful. And these are the Russell Bullock sisters. And I have question marks on this because I'm like 99% sure that, they're, that this is. Um, so it's Elizabeth, um, her half-sister Emma, Sylvia, and her sister Annie. Um, and these are the women that I am desperately searching for. This is Linden Place. It's a snapshot um, of the house decorated for the holidays. And this is the last remaining DeWolf mansion from her great grandfather's era. And in 1810, George DeWolf commissioned the architect Russell, Russell Warren with a cost of $60,000 to build this house on Hope Street. In 1825, George DeWolf, who was still illegally transporting the enslaved into the country well after the act of prohibiting importation of slaves was enacted in 1808, he escaped with his family in the middle of the night in 1925 to the plantation in Cuba to avoid his many creditors in Bristol. He ended up bankrupting the town. His mansion, this mansion was ransacked and the contents were removed. The house sat, ha, sat empty for 15 years and then was a boarding house. In 1865, the house was purchased by George DeWolf's daughter, Theodora Colt. And this is where I will share the story of Elizabeth, Dot's younger sister. Elizabeth Mitchelson Colt, Dot was born in 1858 when Sylvia was 17. I have always sensed that they were not close. There was nothing saved in the trunk about her. Later, this weird how the, those strange ways of how you know something would be proved true, even though I can't describe how I knew it. In 1881, when Dot was 23 years old, she married Samuel Pomeroy Colt. He was a prominent businessman and politician. In 1886, he founded the Industrial Trust Company, which is now Bank of America. The following year, he took over a bankrupt, bankrupt rubber company named the, and named it the United States Rubber Company, which went on to produce, be the largest producer of rubber goods in the country. Their wedding was lavishly covered in the press. Lots of famous and wealthy were in attendance. Harriet Beecher Stowe gave Dot a fan as a present, and Cornelius J. Vanderbilt presented her with an elegant pair of bracelets. They would go to have, on to have three sons, which one of them, Russell, Russell Roswald Colt, would go on to marry Ethel Barrymore, the stage actress. In the same gossipy book about Bristol, with a footnote about Sylvia refusing to see her father, it discusses that Samuel Pomeroy Colt was in love with another woman named Minnie Perry, also a DeWolf descendant, as Dot was. But his mother, Theodora, said she did not come from good enough family and would not allow the marriage. She would make these same accusations of Dot, and in the Colt family papers, at the University of Rhode Island, there was a letter from Jonathan Russell Bullock, which is a basically a cease and desist letter for saying libelous things about Dot's family. This would not be the first letter he would write on behalf of Dot to Theodore Colt. She apparently was so mean to Dot when she was pregnant that he, he questioned that he was that her health. Um, and that he was afraid that she was going to have a miscarriage. In one letter to a friend, she even accuses Dot of wearing her bustle backwards, pretending to be pregnant, which I thought was so fascinating and sort of wondered if that was a, a thing. Um, Samuel Pomeroy Colt said to go to Europe with their two sons, and he carried on many affairs. And there was, and at that time, and I'll show you a letter that she wrote that's in the uh, University of Rhode Island archive. Um, 
Okay, I, I, I read it. It's unfortunately part of the screen is blocked, but dear Pomery, I send you the copy of this letter you wish, not because I deem it right to do so, but because it seemed, as I am dependent on you as president, and as soon as there'll be two little children, I must accept things as they are. Money is the one thing I find to which you show kindness and intention. If I had money, such a life as ours would not be necessary. Less than 16 months ago when you married me, I had both health and good looks and now have lost both. Do you never think that in the future you will have something to answer for and that someday you will reap what you have sowed? But reproaches are worse than useless. If you can suggest any remedy for this present painful situation, I shall be very glad to hear and try to follow your wife. This is just such a, it was such a heartbreaking letter when I sat in the archive and read it. Um, Samuel Pomery Colton Dot went through a great public separation. She filed for divorce, which was a scandal in the late 19th century. She sued on the grounds of his affairs. Samuel Pomery Colt retaliated by suing James J. Van Allen, the son-in-law of Mrs. William Astor and former ministry, minister to Italy for $200,000 for the alienation of her affections. For a while, they lived in what presumed to be unbearably happy conditions in the house divided in half. They never officially divorced, but were separated, but the official cause was desertion. Elizabeth was granted a modest annuity in the use of Linden Place, which would eventually go to her children and grandchildren. Um, now it's turned over, it's actually a, a house museum. And Elizabeth spent her remaining years in Newport. Dot's life was my first portal from a woman's perspective into Sylvia's world. This was her baby sister's life experiences. It was a very sad gaze. I hope Sylvia fared better and had a happier life, but my instinct was that it was not. So, and sadly, I would soon learn the truth. These are some of the things that I photographed. They allowed me to photograph in Linden Place. And this was a music box that was in Dot's bedroom, which I always found so. It's this really happy Rococo scene of a couple. And it really made me consider sort of the, what marriage was in the 19th century um, and how it was seen as, a, as, it just, as, as an economic institution and how your hopes were for happiness. But sadly, this was not the case. This is sort of a photograph in her in Linden Place from the third floor of her sort of gilded prison. Stacy, can I hop in for a sec? Sure. Um, we have a couple of people who are having a hard time hearing you. I, I'm sorry. That's okay. So um, a little slower and a little louder, if you're able, I think would be helpful. Thank okay, you. Okay, so I'm much. sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in this photograph, I'm also closer. Let me know if it's better. You can if you can't hear me. Sounds uh, better to me. It does, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so when I was in the Colt family papers, they have boxes of photographs that are unidentified. And all of a sudden I pulled out this photograph and I sort of fell in, like my, my hands went numb and I just knew it was Sylvia, even though up until this point, I had no idea what Sylvia looked like. And Later, I was proven correct that this was Sylvia and her son, William, but I always found this photograph to be so magical. And they actually let me kind of set up a studio in the archive where I could re-photograph this photograph so I could blow it up really large, which is very exciting. This is a modern interpretation of her sister, Emma, and this was her half-sister. After Sylvia's mother's death in 1866, her father remarried in 1868, and they had one daughter, Emma, born in 1869. Um, in, 18, in 1897, she married a man named Alfred Chesbro. And to share some grim news when I was researching in New York, because I did discover that Sylvia and her family lived both in New York City and Rhode Island, I would discover that she committed suicide in 1908 by shooting herself twice in the head, leaving behind a five-year-old and an infant. The cause was melancholia, but today we would kind of, we, is more understood as postpartum depression. This is Emma. Eight years later, in 1916, her husband, Alfred, would be killed in an auto, early automobile accident on the Colt family land. He was driving with LeBaron Colt and someone else when the steering rod broke and the car, traveling 15 miles per hour, went over the seawall. This is a photograph that a reporter from the Bristol Phoenix had sent me of them kind of taking the car with oxen out after the accident. Emma's two children were now orphaned. Dot, Emma, Dot and Emma lived very sad lives. 
and beloved Annie of the wallpaper samples. So Liz, Sylvia so lovingly saved, died at the age of 40 in New York City from dysentery. On the same day that I discovered about Emma's suicide in the New York Public Library, moments later I found out about Sylvia's second husband who she married on April 26, 1844. Sylvia married a man named Cornelius Van Buren Ostrander in New York City. He was a very prominent businessman that owned a fire insurance company. He was 76 at the time of their marriage and Sylvia was 43. They lived at 38 West 27th Street, which is, was a very fashionable part of town now. This is actually what it is. It's a park um, because the ha their house was torn down sometime between 1911 and 1916. And this is, so it's now a new building is next to it and it's this open air park. This is a film still from a project that, a video project that I'm doing about Sylvia's journals. Um, the shocking, shocking thing that I would discover was is that they married on April 26, 1884 and Cornelius died May 17, 1884, three weeks after they were married. So of course, I immediately went to see if there was a will on file in probate records. And unfortunately there was no will, but there were probate records that were sealed in 1884. And when they came from Queens, because you had to request them, I opened them and they decomposed in my hands because I was probably the first person. So I did discover that his son actually sent out an investigator looking for her because she, was in, she went to Rhode Island. Um, and she ultimately signed over executorship of the will. Um, I did look at the coroner inquests, um, and I also tried to find the medical, I contacted the medical examiner in Rhode Island too about Emma's death, which they sadly laughed at me and said that they would never have records that would go back that far. So this park I now call Sylvia Park because I think it's amazing that in Manhattan, a city with so many buildings, there's this empty space where Sylvia once lived. And I hope one day, and if anyone knows anything about this or can help, let me know. I want to wheat paste a giant Sylvia on the side of the building, but I'm too chicken to do it. I ended up finding about Sylvia's second husband before, anything, before finding out anything about her first husband. And because I had this void for Sylvia, I tried to fill in things visually with things that I did know. This is actually her mother's will. Um, and this sort of made me sad when I discovered this. Um, again, her father was sort of more of a black sheep in the family. And um, this was all that she had. These were her worldly possessions um, when she died in 1866. So that she passed on mostly to her daughters. And what I did is, is I went to thrift stores to find paintings because this whole idea of Sylvia being discarded and then finding discarded things. So this is the Bradford chair that is in Sylvia's, that is in Susan's will. This was from Sylvia's will. And this was a painting taken from a thrift store painting because I had no idea where these objects were at this time. But there's a new chapter to this story and it's meeting Sylvia's great granddaughter. In 2005, my research had stopped with Sylvia's granddaughter, Emily. And to make a very long story short, I will say a random search, a Google search, um, led to a very fortuitous source, which was the Humane Society in Gloucester, Virginia, which Emily was a member of. And when I, call, I, I made a call and to make a long story short, I ended up with the contact information for Sylvia's great granddaughter. And this, and I called her and we had the most amazing conversation I think I've ever had in my entire life. And she, Sylvia's great granddaughter has been so kind and so supportive of my project and research. I'm forever beholden to her because my idea to bring Sylvia back to life um, would never have happened if I didn't have this encounter with her and her kindness and generosity. And she came to New York and we had a wonderful visit. And then she invited me to her home where she had a large steamer trunk filled with all of these amazing objects belonging to Sylvia. Photographs, clothing, her journals, and the rest is sort of history. So here it is, she is, Sylvia. 
Um, this was the first time I had seen a photograph of her other than the daguerreotype of her and her younger sister that was in the trunk that was discarded for garbage. And I thought she was the most beautiful woman. And then I was now became certain that the photograph from the Colt family papers was the same woman. And of course, I think we look a lot of light. So you can put in the chat that we do. So I totally want to hear that. Don't say if you don't. <laughs> um, so I started looking at these photographs and using them. Um, this was a photograph that was made in January 26 in 1864 in Gurney's studio on Broadway. Um, and I just sort of, she was so beautiful and I was so happy to have these images. And I started working creatively with them. This is actually a photograph of Sylvia, but it's my eyes in her face. And I started doing these digital composites where I was putting the two of us together, kind of creating this sort of single person. I could wear her clothing and creepily, we must have been the exact same height and very similar in size because her clothing fits me really well. Um, this is wearing one of her dresses. And then I started when all of this stuff, like this is something like, it just the amount of correspondence and the things that so that Sylvia's great granddaughter had was just amazing. And one of the things that Sylvia liked to do was cut out from Godey's Ladies Book. And what I did to interpret her cut out was to create this whole coloring book set that Sylvia in her parlor in the middle. Um, and I like to kind of do this give and take with the material that she left behind and then me responding to it, sort of having this conversation. And then the journals, these tiny little books, um, which is why I'm in progressives today, because she wrote in pencil and in script. And they are amazing little books that there's nine of them spanning 1858 to 1869 when she was in her late teens to early 20s. And she, and she only writes a sentence a day, but to me, they're just revelations. They're you know, from the amazing things that I discovered, like her going to P.T. Barnum and seeing Jenny Lind perform, to she also saw one of the Booth brothers perform in Romeo and Juliet. And she heard Charles Dickens read a, a Christmas carol, and she, you know, even the small things like walking one day in the snow down from 49th Street to her home on 22nd Street and eating at Delmonico's and seeing Faust and going to the ice cream salon. These books are just magical um, in terms of kind of knowing, kind of grounding where she was and also sort of living in this city at a time that was a such change in New York City. So I use her journal entries to kind of translate visually. And yes, people did wear red nail polish in the next. That's a joke, they did. But. <laughs> um, one of the first things that I did was went to Beacon Street to see the military and the prince and went to the ball in his honor, had a magnificent time. So of course the invitation that was in the trunk was his first thing to sort of creating this story because in the invitation there's a dance card but the dance card was blank. So it left this mystery as if she actually attended and I did found she did. So when I was doing research at the Boston Public Library, I found this, um, this stereo view by this photographer named Delos Barnum. And because it's public domain, they give me permission to use it. Um, what I did is, is I actually did a little, like I just from thinking about this and, and thinking in Sylvia's world, I actually wanted to be with her. So I actually put myself in the photograph. Um, I won't tell where, I can try to find it. But I wanted to kind of be in this scene because potentially I know she was at this parade. So maybe she was in this photograph. I then went to photograph the ball honoring the Prince of Wales in Newport, Rhode Island at an 1860s ball um, because I wanted to, again, use the present to um, find her life experiences in the past. Um, this is one of my very favorite photographs from the series. This is what she wore to the ball. And it's me in her dress. She left behind. This dress is stunning. And then the Civil War. Um, the Civil War was a it was a big consideration. Sylvia was in her 20s when this happened, and she lost a lot of loved ones fighting for the Union. Unfortunately, Sylvia didn't write too much about politics um, in her journal. She wrote really about the Civil War, mostly when she would attend, be attending a funeral for someone that she knew. Um, but this, the war and the loss in her life, um, both her life and collectively, inspired me to go to Civil War reenactments to find the people in her life, in my life. So this is her, um, 
friend and probably cousin, Georgie DeWolf, an unknown Union soldier. You guys can decide which is which. But this man, Joseph Judson Dimmick, and this is another love story within this love story. And Joseph Judson Dimmick, or Judd as he was known, was um, he was married to her cousin Dora, and he was 12 years her senior. He was a major in the 82nd New York Infantry. And there was something between them. He sent him the most beautiful, heartbreaking letters soon after the Battle of Bull Run. And he made this prophecy that it was going to be a long and bloody war. This is a photograph of Judd by Matthew Brady. In these letters, he tells her he doesn't want to be a carpet knight. And I just thought that term was so fantastic. And what I, when I looked it up, it was a term for um, being appointed sort of a, a knight in court, but you never actually saw active battle. Um, he tells her that he thinks of her often and wishes to see her in these letters. He mentions in the letter, they have to talk about that thing that happened between them, which just tortures me. Sylvia was going to marry Judd's younger brother, William, and Judd knew this. And I wonder if her mind, he thought it would be the next best thing to marrying Judd because that was impossible. I also think she was very motivated to get out of her father's house. And I do know that, I do think that she loved him and something happened between them because this is her journal entry from 1859. Where she says, oh my God, what shall I do? Mr. Bullock has found out all and forbidden me to even speak to my darling DJJ, which I know she does a lot of coding in her journal, which has been very exciting to sort of figure out these different codes, which is um, Joseph Judson Dimmick. I think she just reversed the initials for that. Um, and Mr. Bullock, because that's how she referred to her father. He was never father or pa or uh, dad or any sort of term in endearment. So when Sylvia, so Judd actually had warned her about marrying William. He said that he's kind of a philanderer and that, that he doesn't think that their tempers were ill-suited. But he did say in one letter, he said, loving you like a sister would be second best to loving you like a wife. And somehow I still read that line and I've read this letter over and over again and it still gives me goosebumps every time I read it because it's so profoundly beautiful and moving. When Judd and William are at war, Sylvia is between Brooklyn and Rhode Island. William is discharged and Judd remains, is fighting. Um, Judd ends up contracting typhoid fever. These are her journal entries. Um, letters saying that Judd was worse, if only I could go, June 19th, 1862. And then June 22nd, 1862, oh dear me, what fate, poor Judd growing worse, had a telegram from William, if only I was with him. And I think of this entry as an ambiguous poem because I don't know if she meant with William or with Judd. I like to think Judd. And I know she prayed and she prayed and this is a letter from William, um, which I'll give everyone a couple of seconds, unfortunately. Screens are popped up, so I, I can't read the, the whole thing. Um, if anyone comments in the chat that they want me to read it, Ariel. I will definitely let you know. I'll give people. I'm, re I'm reading it for now. Okay. One person said, please read. Do you want me to read it? Can you, you, because I have to, the, the windows are blocking part of it. If you, thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I am watching poor Judd tonight. Tis still as death all about, accepting his occasional fits of pain and his loud orders to his regiment. He has imagined himself the past few hours with his men and has this moment ordered his horses saddled that he may ride forward with the advance. Oh, so sad. He has thought himself in Hartford, in New York and in Bristol. He says he would like to see Sylvia. He has just called Barry Barry and tis pitiful to listen to him. His strength is about wasted and unless some great change occurs very soon, he will know us no more. It is hard to be with him and see him suffer so, and not to have him recognize us, or for us to be able to ease him. He is living now only on stimulants, brandy and milk, wow, 
and is at the same time taking dreadfully strong medicines. The doctor gives no encouragement tonight, and Judd's constitution can alone save him. He has unnatural strength at times, and then again can scarcely raise his head. He has not had his reason for 11 days. Reason, wow. He put his ring on Dora's finger yesterday. His fingers have grown so thin that it dropped off. Everybody here is kind and attentive, but if he is doomed to die, all our attentions cannot save him. And I fear, if we can judge from his symptoms and the doctor impressions, that before you receive this, I shall have telegraphed you sad news, however. While there is still life, there is hope, and there is a possibility that he may yet rally. Oh, thank you. Of course. <laughs> oh, it's still like reading that letter. I, I, I've read it so many times, but it's so moving. Um, and sadly, Judd did die soon after. Um, in the next letter, William writes, which I also found to be really heartbreaking and used as source material for this photograph, but he writes that he's trying to get Judd's horse decommissioned from the war, that this animal, poor animal, has seen so many, so much fighting that he really hopes that he can get the horse um, out um, so it will not be in, in battle anymore. And she goes to the funeral in Hartford and she takes flowers from his grave. And in that journal, there are pressed flowers. I don't know for certain if these are th those flowers, but she took flowers, she writes that she took flowers from his grave. And then Sylvia marries Judd's younger brother, William Davis Dimmick, on October 29th, 1862. This is their wedding photograph that was made in that day. Um, the wedding reception was a luncheon at her family home on State Street. And very soon afterwards, even by Thanksgiving of 1862, she writes in her journals about her husband William's alcoholism, physical abuse, and desertion. She exhibits a lot of sadness, anger, but most of all resilience in protecting herself and her only son, William, who was born in 1864. And this photograph has always struck me because I know in the 19th century, people didn't smile in photographs, but there is something so profoundly sad for this being a wedding photograph as sort of a prophecy of, of what is to come. This is a photograph of Sylvia and her son in 1864, soon after his birth. Though divorce was legal at the time, it was not considered proper for a woman of her social standing. And this is one of her journal entries dated 1866, feeling miserably all day long, went to ride with William. The doctor came and vaccinated and he came home drunk, beats me and hurts the baby, which is so hor horrible to think as that she was a survivor of domestic violence um, because that's a very hard reality in today's world. But it's sort of even unfathomable without the support systems um, that she was uh, experienced this in the middle of the 19th century. And I choose to, and I show this, and one of the things that Sylvia's great granddaughter had always said to me is don't shy away from the hard things in Sylvia's life. Um, and, you know, I, and because of her resilience and the strength that she shows, she was such a strong woman for the 19th century. And um, she's kind of become my hero in so many ways. And this is a photograph, a modern interpretation of her and her widow leads. Um, William died on September 30th, 18. 1873. Shortly before, he wrote her this letter that's on the Astor House stationery, um, the big hotel downtown, asking her to meet him. And I don't know if she ever met him or not. Um, and a month later, he was, he had died. He was 36 years old. Um, and his cause of death was sort of complications from alcoholism. He left Sylvia destitute. Um, and saved in her correspondence is a letter from her mother-in-law denying her money. She ended up having to live with an aunt because she had no support system with her father. And this again was that aforementioned letter where she showed such strength in sort of kind of arguing with her father um, about, what you, about why she was appreciative and grateful for her aunt, even if he didn't think she was. Um, and again, it just shows how logical her mind was. And one thing in this letter too, is she stood up for herself. 
Um, and I've always admired her boldness and just the way that she could stand up for herself as a 19th century woman. She was not a wallflower. This photo, this entry is from 1866. My darling mother was carried out of the house for the last time. We put flowers that she loved so dearly around her and laid her in the grave where she is with the Lord. And this is a photograph of, this is a photograph of me in the house on State Street where her mother died um, and where I think she would have watched them take her body out of the house. Um, I am in a dress that I had recreated, which I'll just show you again, the source material, um, so I could dress like Sylvia. I love this dress. It kind of could become a Mrs. Miss Havisham type thing where I will wear it every single day. Um, but I'm a strong believer in the ambiguity of the photographic image. I think the very same photograph can present both a truth and a fiction. And all of my photographs do just this. They are the truth, but they are not all truthful. And I make, and I say this because this is the closest I can get to time traveling. And I have tried so desperately the amount of times I have stood in Madison Square Park in the snow for some reason, maybe because of reading Jack Finney, although that was Central Park. I think that I can, and I'll stand there and I'll close my eyes and I'll be like, when I open them, it's going to be 1866. And I'll say it over and over again. And so one time I even wore Sylvia's dress just to be prepared if I did go back, I would be properly dressed. And it, I just always awake to the present, sadly. So I have to figure out a way to time travel in my photographs. And that's both the challenge and the very exciting thing about this project. I'd love to take, I love to take self-portraits of Sylvia. This is in her house on State Street. And this is a letter, so this is um, a bundle of letters that Sylvia saved that were written to her from her sister Annie. And it says, letters written by my only, which is underlined sister, while in Boston and New York in the autumn of 1878. And it's, it, you know, it's a little snarky because she did have her younger sister Dot, who was born 17 years before her, and also her half-sister Emma. Um, but obviously she was only really close with her sister Annie. My modern interpretation of Annie. Um, Annie went to the ladies' uh, seminary in Philadelphia. I have her journals, um, which are also really fascinating. And I have one of the things that I absolutely love that is preserved in the collection is her school paper about the politics of 1860, which was really quite fascinating to read and, and quite smart for a 17-year-old girl. This is an actual photograph of Annie. And this is from one of her journals, um, which I just am so moved because I love how she was practicing her signature and she was trying out different bees, like one with more squirrely bee, another of just sort of kind of, you know, when you're young, figuring out what is my signature going to look like? And this was actually the day her sister Dot was born. This has stayed all day with Anita, had a splendid time until evening when unpleasant news made me come home. So I'm pretty positive the unpleasant news was actually the birth of her sister Dot. So my thought that they were clo not close to begin with um, was sort of proven true in, in terms of um, what I would later come to know about Sylvia, that they were not close. This is my interpretation of Dot. I came home, found a telegram saying that Grandpa DeWolf was dead, so I had to give up going to the sociable. So disappointed. I, love, I mean, granted, I can't imagine Sylvia ever thought that there would be this woman 150 years later that would become obsessed with her and do all this work about her and spend two decades of her life researching and, and making work. But I love, you know, she's so honest. She couldn't get in the sociable. The next day, the entry was that she had to go by morning, and not that she, morning clothes, and not that she had, not that she used an exclamation point, but I sensed an exclamation point. So I made this photograph um, about that journal entry. Rained hard all day. Oh, how dreadfully low I feel all the time. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I wish I was dead. November 11th, 1860. Now, what was so astonishing for me about this journal entry was, is that journals, in, when I read a lot of scholarship about how journals were used for women in the 19th century, it was more of a pragmatic tool. Like you wrote about who you saw, what you did. Um, and it was kind of this, it was encouraged for women to do this so they could kind of, you know, start running households and keeping track of things. So 
I love, you know, just in terms of this being so modern in terms of how we think of journals today that are very personal um, and that we use as personal reflection. And I mean, this was really hard to, to look at. Um, and again, her honesty. It's a photograph in response to that. It's actually one of her dresses. Went to church in the morning, read the rest of the day. I wish I was with Anita tonight. November 18th, 1860. Friend Anita. And this photograph um, is of, so uh, there's a small envelope in her collection of papers and it says, uh, Kiss by Edward Everett, henceforth and always precious, April 18th, 1860. So Edward Everett was, um, he was kind of a very, very well-known man at, at that time period. He was a US Senator. He was the 15th governor of Massachusetts. He was minister to Great Britain, the United States Secretary of State, and he taught and was the president of Harvard. He was also, um, he, was, he was a famous um, orator, and he was actually, before Lincoln gave the three-minute Gettysburg Address, he gave what was apparently like a two-hour speech before that in 1863, directly preceding Abraham Lincoln. Um, they, they corresponded. I do have a letter, like he sent her, um, she, I guess, told him about her marriage and he wrote her back. So, um, you know, she was definitely really enamored with him, as you can see in this entry and also saving that kiss by Edward Everett in that flower. So that flower is very old. Um, heard my darling Edward Everett, had a long talk with him afterwards. Oh, how perfect he is. The last night I shall sleep in my dear old room. And this is me in what I think was Sylvia's room in the house, interpreting that photograph. And one of my favorite journal entries that she writes a lot, um, and it, it's just, just and it's, I don't know, it's even more so profound right now because I wish I could be with my friends. Um, but it says, out with the girls. She was out with the girls a lot. So this is my out with the girls. So, a new kind of take on this project is a few years ago, I had silk screened this dress with Sylvia's image and I'm actually wearing a dress with Sylvia on it today because I love having her with me at all times. And um, it became this obsession where I started silk screening a lot of things with Sylvia on it. And I did this series of photographs where I'm showing her these dresses. And sometimes when I get in this, you know, like I, again, that idea of like, could Sylvia have ever fathomed that this woman is going to now wear her on her clothing or any of this um, when she passed away in 1925. <laughs> so this is my series of photographs um, of all different dresses. I can do, I have casual and fancy at Sylvia's grave. Stacy, where is she buried? Oh, she is buried in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island in Juniper Hill Cemetery, which is a very old cemetery. So beautiful. It's a beautiful cemetery. And lastly, um, so Sylvia had an exhibition at the Merchant's House that went up in January. Um, sadly, with the, the way the world changed, she's um, still at the museum. But um, just to kind of talk a little bit about why I, the show, the exhibition, um, the Merchant's House Museum, for those that have not been there, and you absolutely should, it is the best place in New York City. And this, it's uh, the house that belonged to the Treadwell family. And I first went to the Merchant's House when I was researching Sylvia because it, Sylvia was a contemporary of the youngest daughter, Gertrude. Gertrude was born in 1840 and Sylvia was born in 1841. And I wanted to see what Sylvia's, none of her homes in New York still exist. And even if they did, they wouldn't be as preserved 19th century um, house. So I wanted to see what her life was like. And again, and, and because she was a contemporary of Gertrude, um, it just became the most fantastic place in the entire world to show this work. Because unfortunately, um, whereas I know a lot about Sylvia's life now, 
they don't know as much about, or there's not as much known about Gertrude's life. And we don't know. And one of the magical things is, is that Sylvia and Gertrude could have known each other. Um, they certainly could have been together at, a, at some kind of, at a church, to hear a speaker at church. Um, they definitely kind of ran in sort of similar social circles. I know Sylvia tended to, at least from her journals, hang out with people she knew from Rhode Island, but that's not to preclude that they weren't in the same room together. And that's so exciting. So what I did in, is using the display cases in the home. Um, this is sort of, I created Sylvia wallpaper and this is actually her trunk. So people are always, you know, to get a visual of what the trunk actually looked like, it was a small trunk. Um, it was about, it's about a foot and a half by 10 inches long. So it's a, and display there was the party invitation for the ball honoring the Prince of Wales. Um, this is some of the objects in the trunk that were displayed. And this was the first time that I ever, I've displayed sort of my work interpreting Sylvia, but this was the first time I've ever shown the contents of the trunk. And it was incredibly moving to see these out in the display cases, um, her world and life sort of laid out this way. These are some of the photographs. Um, a Valentine, her list of wedding presents. Um, her invitation to the Harrison White House for the Daughters of the American Revolution conference. And this is some of the silkscreen clothing that I use her. That's her signature. Um, it's a leather jacket that, that I almost didn't want to put in the show because I wanted to wear it so badly. It was a tough one. Um, this is her paper dolls, using that as the dress, and then also the photographs of the paper dolls. Loves. And I loved kind of filling the spaces with clothing and using the, the merchant's house. This, these rooms that were very much like rooms she would have lived in um, became such an amazing sort of showcase for Sylvia's objects. It's, it's such a beautiful show at the house. And it, sadly, I wish it got to stay up longer. And then a lot of photographs sort of interpreting. This is in the matriarch of the house, Eliza bedroom. That's the photograph of the ball. And I'm almost done. So I want to end with this poem um, and I'll read it. Um, Smiles by the letter C. Now I probably could have written this poem, um, but my letter starts, with the, but my name starts with the letter S. So I didn't actually write it, but the sentiment is all there. One asked me where the sunlight grew and where it never dies. In silence then I pointed to the heaven in Sylvia's eyes. Another where the moon doth go when paled by morning's glare. Gaze, gaze on Sylvia's breast of snow, you'll see the moonlight there. A third said, where doth virtue rest? Then forth my words did start. In Sylvia's face you'll find express the goodness of her heart. In search of beauty, grace and wit, no longer vainly stray. Seek Sylvia's shrine and at her feet your endless homage pay. And there we end with Sylvia. And I will say that poem was sent to Sylvia by Judd's child. Cut, it was cut out in a little envelope and it said, my dad cut this out because he thought of you. So one last modern thing that I do for Sylvia is I have given her her own Instagram so she can post like it's the 19th century and the 21st century. So I thank you so much for listening to my lecture. And um, I'm so grateful again for being here tonight. And I'm happy to answer any questions if people have any. I've been, hello, thank you so much. This is, it's just so amazing. Um, so I've been looking through the Q&A, so, um, a, 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 few, a few people have asked sort of similar questions about the trunk. Um, so how did it get to Crosby Street? Who threw it away and why? Who found it? Um, yeah, I know, that's, that's always a popular question. Um, so I was, my old roommate is the one that found the trunk. And I do know who, how from kind of, I do know who now who threw out the trunk. And it's funny because people always think that that's like, I wish I could meet this person and give them like the biggest hug, which we don't do in a pandemic. I know because this person, <laughs> like them not wanting this has changed my life in such a meaningful way. Um, so I do know, I do know it was a, it was a family member um, that threw out that or 
it was that the Trump didn't make it when they moved. And um, I am so grateful to this person because the trunk found who it was supposed to go to. But I was not the one that found it. My old roommate had found it. Amazing. Um, Jennifer says that you do look alike, so that's good Thanks. affirmation. <laughs> um, Marianne wanted to know, early in your talk, you mentioned a, ch a church in Bristol. Yes. What was that church? St. Michael's Church in Bristol. Okay. And can you also remind us of the name of Sylvia's old house, which is now a hotel? A oh, it's called the Wissing House. It's W-I-S-S-I-N-G. And it's named, the owner, um, it, it's, um, it's this woman named Yanni Wissing. And she's incredible. She's so lovely. Um, so if you do go, say you know, say you know Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she... Um, She's, she came, her husband was a very famous graphic designer in the Netherlands and um, came to teach at RISD and sadly he's passed away. But um, it's extraordinary because a lot of his artwork is in the home. So that's always nice to see. And amazingly throughout the years in that house, people have not changed. Like there's still like, there's no showers. It's still the bathtubs. Like all the original light fixtures are just, they're all there. They're just electrified. And also they have the original pole oven from when um, the house was built in 1850 is still there. Oh, that's so, that's so. It really is a blast. Like you're in a house that definitely feels like it has sort of stood the test of time. It's amazing. Um, somebody, who was it? Um, Danielle wanted to know more about why Sylvia and Dot had such a bad relationship. I think, you know, I think that Sylvia had this, this is my, you know, again, it's just my hypothesis, but I think Sylvia had this very, this, she was very close with her sister that was two years younger than her. And I think, I, 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 you know, I can't say for certain, but it doesn't seem like, you know, it was such a big gap that Dot might have necessarily been planned. And I think that that sort of disruption of her, you know, I think she was very close with her mother and she was very close with her um, sister Annie. And I think that that, um, probably disrupted those relationships is why she was not close with her. That's sort of the thought that I, you know, she was almost, I mean, she, you know, she, you know, Dot was actually closer in age to Sylvia's son than she was to Sylvia. So I think that that age gap probably caused a lot of, but I thought that was like unpleasant news. Like that's a, that's a polite. <laughs> it's very polite. Um, Carol Teller, hi Carol, um, wants to know if Sylvia was a common name at that time and in that class of society. I, you know, I, I do know that um, her, her grandmother was named Sylvia. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. It, it, it's not, I mean, there's, you know, I think there's names that you see with more regularity at that time. I don't think it was necessarily common or uncommon. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's, all, that's all right. Um, we also got a question just now from Heather about her friend Anita. Do you know anything else about her? Anita, that sounded very special. Yeah, Anita, um, Anita lived down, she lived um, in the house, so the church would have, the, there was the church that was built in between them, and then Anita lived in the other house, um, and her house is still there too, um, which I love to, I love to kind of walk the, that distance between the two homes, and she was at Anita's a lot, and it seemed like she really was very happy with the Smith family, it seemed like they kind of, um, again, because I know her relationship with her father was not a good one, and it seemed like they did a lot of things. Like I know they took her to Newport and she also, Anita had a brother, John Henry, and it seemed like they were all really close and really good friends. And, um, and I think she probably felt safer and happier in Anita's house because she was always in Anita's house when she was in Bristol. It was, um, you know, I, I, it seemed like it was a, a, probably a happier home than maybe her home was. Yeah. We've gotten also a couple of, like really delightfully spooky questions, which yeah. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna mush together a, a couple of these questions. Um, so Stacy and Patricia both are sort of picking up on um, your your connection with Sylvia, especially vis-a-vis um, -vis seeing her father's ghost, you know, in the in the edge of your picture and. 
I guess the, the questions are like, how do you, how do you see your relationship with her through, through time? Like, is it that you feel her presence and, and, um, and then to sort of add to that, when, when you feel these things, how do you assimilate the hardships of her life, which are separate from, from your own? It's, you know, it, um, it, it sometimes, you know, it's, it, it's, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, it's a, a very a, personal question. I to no, no, <laughs> to remind myself that I'm not Sylvia, that I'm Stacy, that I'm like, no, 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 this is, this is, this is not, this was not my life, that I'm a, that we, we're, we're separate people, because in some ways I, I've sort of merged, so I'm spending so much time, I, um, thinking about her and I, I, I do like, I, I think of her, like I do, and I don't, I, I, it's not so much a presence or like it's, she's, but she's just always with me. And I find myself, you know, I talk to her, um, I ask her counsel. She's an <laughs> um, ancestor. She's, <laughs> and you know, I, I just, you know, and a part of me too is because I've spent so much time on this project and it's still so sustaining for me and it manifests itself in so many different ways. And um, the silkscreen kind of images being the newest version um, that, like, I can't imagine her not with me. And, um, and I do, and I, I, I think in some ways, she kind of gives me the strength and, and this will sound kind of funny, but in a situation where I don't sometimes have to be Stacy. I'll sometimes introduce myself as Sylvia because I can, I feel like I can be like a saucier version of myself, like a braver version of myself. Um, because one of the things that I've sort of in researching Sylvia sort of come to discover is I feel like Sylvia was a bolder woman in the 19th century than I am in the 19th century and then 21st century. So when I need some of her boldness, I'm Sylvia instead of Stacy. I like that very much. Um, Erica is wondering if you can put back up the picture that you added yourself to so that she can try to find you in it. Okay. Um, if you can. Um, and in the meantime, um, when you, when you talked to Sylvia's great granddaughter, does she have other descendants? Have you... Do, do you know um, like what they what they intend to do with the things of hers that they've inherited? That I wait. I'm sorry. Let me try to share. Okay. Oh, I'm getting mine. There we go. I've 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 definitely been in touch with some descendants. Um, I I don't know. Um, that I don't know the answer to. Um, well, where the stuff will eventually. Yeah, fo folks are also asking about her relationship with her father and why, why it was so bad. I, you know, this is sort of, again, total hypothesis, sort of, but I feel like if Sylvia was born a boy, they would have had a great relationship. I think that Sylvia was very strong-willed and I think she was very smart. And I think she stood up for herself and I think she said it like, you know, she would, she was not kind of a, a shrinking violet, so to speak. So I think if she was actually born a boy, they would have had a very different relationship. But I think because, um, you know, she, she, you know, seems, you know, that she didn't take kind of his, you know, she just disassociated herself with him. So. I don't know the, the actual specifics if something happened and there was a rupture. Um, I do know that I did find later on reading these letters that were written to her sister Annie um, at one point when they were younger. Um, I think you know, Sylvia was maybe like 10 or 12 at that point because Annie I think was 10 and he, you know, he calls her Syl and I was like, oh my god, like this term of endearment. So I'm not sure what specifically happened, but I really feel like I think it was because Sylvia was a kind of a, a strong woman that um, they just clashed. And maybe they had such similar personalities that they clashed, but also in, that I would discover in letters later from uh, Sylvia's mother that he was very stern, like he was not 
um, you know, he was not well liked in the town. That was another footnote in the book where apparently someone was like applauding when his funeral went by. Oh, gosh. <laughs> thank god the old like toad is dead or so you know there's i mean i don't think he was particularly like a um you know a very you know i think he was kind of a, a very hard man to deal with was what but i'm worried about saying things because i don't want him to haunt my dreams tonight <laughs> <laughs> so i have i'm gonna ask you two more questions sure. um the first is a question from alexa which um she was wondering if there was anything that you found. Um, I know, I know she was a church goer, but were there things that she wrote about her spirituality or spiritualism? No, um, she was pretty, I mean, I know she went to church a lot. Like on most Sundays it would be like spent all day in church. Um, so I know she was in church a lot, I think. Um, but she never sort of wrote anything specifically other than like if she heard you know was going to a lecture or so or went to trinity or, or a different church like she would go to do sometimes go to grace church in the city um so but she didn't write specifically about her spirituality okay now now i'm getting questions is that you in the roadway to the right of the tree in black are you yes. in the middle yes i am talking unchaperoned to a gentleman how dare you? How dare I? <laughs> Amazing. And I make physical stereo views. Like, that's what they are. They, the, the actual photographs are stereo views. And I've gotten so good at it that I don't think you would not know it wasn't from the 19th century at this point. It's amazing. I mean, I definitely, I definitely wouldn't know. And so my last question for you is about the future. Um, a number of people have asked, are you still researching about Sylvia? Are you still making more art? Are you thinking about publishing her journals? What comes next for you and Sylvia? Well, I'm hoping that uh, Sylvia and I, I, I'm actually working on a book, um, and which the title is The Girl of My Dreams, as you, as you sort of mentioned in the, um, the bio, which is sort of an illustrated narrative nonfiction book about Sylvia's life. So um, that I will hope will one day be published. Um, I am very excited about launching this clothing line for her because I know she was very fashionable. Um, and she did talk about clothing in her journal. So I am creating this line of clothing with 19th century women, um, not with her on it, but other women. She, I'm the only one that can wear a Sylvia. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm doing that. And I'm also um, working on a project, a new visual project, which I'm trying to find, um, which I'm exploring my own family history and trying to find two great aunts that died in the Holocaust. Oh, amazing. All right. Well, we have gotten so many, so many great messages and so many great questions. I'm sorry that we can't answer them all. Um, but for all of you who are, he who are still here with us, the 110 of you, Thank you all so much for staying with us. We're gonna send out an email um, following up from, from this event. And so I'm going to include the link to the virtual ex exhibition at the Merchant's House Museum. So oh, thank can, you, yes. So that you, all, so that you all can check it out. Um, and if any of you have other questions, feel free to shoot me an email. And um, have a really great night, everyone. Thank you so much, Stacey. Oh, thank you so much. Is there any way that I can look at the, the chat is saved or because I didn't look at it at all? Oh, of course. I will um I will send it to you. Oh, thank you. I'd love to see it if people. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Take good care. That's so great.